All right, people are still trickling in and I'm sure people will be uh, joining us over the course of today's webinar, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is John Darcy. I'm a director of business development uh, here at SkyBridge and we're very excited to uh, welcome you for a special webinar, something a little different uh, than we often do on these webinars, but are gonna have a lot of fun today uh, with a great guy that we've gotten to know, especially over the last year or so. Uh, so excited to bring his commentary, both on his life, career uh, and post-career activities as well. Uh, and that is Mr. Jeremy Roenick. Uh, to those of you who are big hockey fans, I'm sure uh, many people joining today are big hockey fans. He's a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him that introduction anyways. Uh, JR, as he uh, is affectionately known, is a nine-time NHL All-Star and a two-time member of the U.S. Olympic men's ice hockey team. Uh, he's a native of Boston, uh, and after a successful junior hockey career that in included under multiple state titles over there at Thayer Academy, he was drafted by the Chicago Blackhawks eighth overall in the 1988 NH NHL entry draft. Uh, he made his debut with the Blackhawks only a year later at the age of 19, uh, and he made the first of nine NHL All-Star Game appearances in 1991, uh, and that was the first of three seasons where he put up more than 100 points uh, in each of those seasons. In 1992, uh, JR helped Chicago reach the Stanley Cup Finals for the first time since 1973, and during that playoff run, he recorded 18 points in 20 playoff games. Later with the Phoenix Coyotes, uh, Roenick was the only player in league history to lead his team in goals, assists, points, and penalty minutes in two different seasons. I think that perfectly sums up the type of player uh, that he was, always causing problems, but, but good problems or good trouble, as they say. Uh, he also played in six game sevens, and I think this also sums up uh, the type of player and person that he is in those six game sevens. He scored six goals, uh, which represented the second most in NHL history uh, during, during Stanley Cup playoff games. Uh, he played twice in the Olympics, earning a silver medal with the U.S. team at the 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake City, Utah. And altogether, uh, JR scored 23 goals and had 25 assists while wearing that Team USA sweater uh, in international competition. He spent his last seven years uh, playing with the Flyers in Philadelphia, the L.A. Kings, the Phoenix Coyotes, as I mentioned, and the San Jose Sharks. And he finished his career as the second highest American-born goal scorer in NHL history. I'm going to editorialize here a little bit. The fact that he's not in the Hall of Fame is an absolute travesty, and hopefully uh, that gets rectified here shortly. But in total, JR scored 513 goals in his career, 703 assists, and 1,363 career games. But his proudest achievement by far, I know, uh, for JR is his uh, beautiful wife, Tracy as well as his uh, kids, his son, Brett, and his daughter, Brandy. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Scaramucci to host the majority of the interview, but I'm gonna selfishly interject with some questions. We also want this to be very interactive. So please submit your questions oh. using that Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen on Zoom. Anthony, if, if people are joining, they probably know you, but Anthony is the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. He's the chairman of SALT. And uh, I, I think as, as JR was saying before we went live, you know, JR is maybe one of the only people uh, that's offended more people than Anthony has. But uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony. Well, well, we're going to try to, we're going to try to set the record straight today, but, but John, not that I ever editorialize your introductions, but I wouldn't have called the wife beautiful. I'm looking at the penalty minutes here and I would have called her like polite or nice or something like that. I, don't know if I, would, I, I, would, I would just said hot. Just, yeah, just, yeah. Just, All right, well, you see that? I have license. I have license. Because Jeremy's the guy. When I was a kid, okay, I was a pretty smart street smart kid. When I walked into the bar, I'd look over at that sob and I say, "Okay, where's that guy's girlfriend? I got to stay as far away from that guy and his girlfriend as possible, so I don't get knocked out in this bar." Okay, but Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Your, uh, your, your. In addition to your career as a hockey player. Uh, as a radio and television personality. You're also a great motivational speaker and you're also somebody that is a champion of young people. And so we have great admiration for all of that. Thank you. I want you Thank to you. explain the hockey mentality. Uh, what does it take to be great on the ice and how do we transfer that into greatness in life and business? It's a great question. And, and I think one thing about uh, my sport and the sport of hockey uh, unlike basketball, unlike baseball, unlike football or any of these sports, um, hockey, you rely on finding and getting used to an alternate form of transportation. 
right? That's my best way of describing it. So you have to learn to do the things that you do on your normal feet and on edges that are that on skate blades that are like so small. So to have the determination and the wherewithal to know that it's going to be frustrating, it's going to be hard, it's gonna be painful because when you put these skates on, they're not the most comfortable things that you have to put on. So it's not like just going into your backyard, picking up a basketball and throwing a, you know, throwing a couple of shots, getting about, you know, pitching with your dad or your brothers or your friends or picking up a football game. You need specific uh, entities and specific things to be able to play hockey. So number one, you have to have the fortitude. You have to have the desire and the love for the game to push through some of the, some of the characteristics that hockey brings. It's not the cheapest sport to play. So I think for the hockey player, you get a, a total different amount of respect for the game, for what you have to do and what you have to put into it to become successful. Now, then you have, when you get onto the game and you play a game that is so physical, it is so fast, it is, it is so in your face type of game, you have to build thick skin, Anthony. You have to have that, that drive, you have to have that ability to withstand pain, you have to have that ability to, uh, uh, to withstand a lot of things that hockey brings that other sports don't bring. So, you know, I learned that at an early age. Uh, I learned that pain was, uh, was a way of, 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 of pushing me forward. I'll tell you a funny story. So when I, was, when I became a pro hockey player, my dad would watch every single game on television. And when I started a game, and if something happened in the first period where I got cut or blood was dripping down my face, my dad would turn to my mom and go, it's all over. He's going to have a great game. He's going he's gonna to dominate this game because he's in it. He's in the game. He's Now he's invested. His blood is – now he's going to get mad. And when you get mad, you show a different kind of determination that I showed that I – you know, I'm, I'm going to take you to the cleaners. I'm going to take you to the wall. So I think, you know, becoming a hockey player at such an early age taught me to be able to uh, be durable, to withstand a lot of, uh, a lot of pressures and a lot, of, a lot of the tough parts that life brings. And, you know, I always want to do something – different than everybody else i wanted to be the, the the guy that everybody relied on and you know hockey hockey really really trained me inside and trained my brain to to make sure that i never never quit or i wasn't denied you know i mean it's it's a, it's a great story it's great motivational uh, uh ideas and concepts the thing that sticks out to me is the thickness of skin and i'm not talking surviving the yeah. 800 plus stitches that you've endured and things like that. I'm talking about dealing with the trials and tribulations of life and business. And we've got young people that are dialed in here as well as parents, uh, uh, fellow FAs and partners of SkyBridge. Um, and man, people get blasted in social media. I've obviously had, when, when I got ejected from the White House, I was mm -hmm. rolled in broken glass and then they salted me in margarita salt and then they yep. lit me up on late night comedy. And you Sounds like me have, with NBC. Sounds like me with NBC. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you either have the stomach for that or you don't have the stomach for that. So we've got parents, students, kids. What would you say to people about developing skin toughness in an age of universal social media and an age where the village idiot has now become the global village idiot because he has a social platform like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Mm -hmm. Well, I think number one, you have to be good in your own skin. I think number one, you got to love yourself and you have to have confidence in yourself. If you have that, uh, if you work at that characteristic and that trait uh, and that quality um, and really, and, and that comes from your work ethic, Anthony, like, you know, just as well, you work your ass off to make sure that you get to a certain point in your life or you do certain things. And by the way, you're going to fail. I'm going to fail. We're all going to fail. Failure is one of the most important things in our life because it, it teaches us to want something more and to, and to work harder and to drive to success. I always was of the mentality that I hated losing more than I loved winning. So when you have that ability to lose, you also have that ability to want to win more. So no matter what happens to you in life, and, and we've all had bad things happen you were just referencing the White House expo, uh, expenditure. I was, I was ex 
you know, thrown out of NBC for stupid reasons, whatever so we, the case we, may we be. We have to be in separate booths because you're mentioning my White House experience and Darcy's smiling away. You know, he thinks <laughs> it's great that I got my ass kicked at the White House, right? If we were in the same building, I'd be pummeling him and being in the penalty box right now. Yeah. Continue, Jeremy. I just had to point out that yeah, Darcy's no, it's a great point. That shit even grin on his face. No, it's a great point. But I think in, in continuing with that mentality, the people that are going to be successful are the people that, that don't let those situations bring you down and they don't let them deter, like affect you or that's not your, that's not your end game. The people that fight for themselves and fight for their personality, for their work ethic, for their, their credibility, the people that fight back and the people that continue to go forward to say, I'll show you rather than some of the some of the the people in this generation now that are more more i think susceptible to being being powders you don't pout when somebody somebody doesn't support you or you get kicked out or they say you're you know you're not going to be anything you stand up and you stand on the table and you pound your chest you don't hide underneath the table yeah, I think, I think I think it's great commentary. Yeah, right? You have to right? deflect and reflect things as opposed to absorb them. I certainly try to tell my children that. There's just a lot of pressure out there. You you've been amazing on the charity circuit. You've been amazing on fan engagement. Uh, and one of the things when when I see your name or I hear you speak, I say, okay, this guy's incredibly authentic. Mm-hmm. Where does all that come from? Where does that drive to serve others come from? So uh, I was seven years old and I was playing, I was living in Hartford, Connecticut. And at the time, Gordie Howe, who is called, who is Mr. Hockey, one of the greatest players in the history of the, uh, of the National Hockey League. Um, he was playing for the Hartford Whalers and he was playing with his two sons. Kind of really weird. Your father was playing with two sons in the Hartford Whalers. But I, I had a game on, sun, on a Saturday morning. Uh, we got off the ice. The Whalers came on for their pregame skate, and I'm hanging over the glass, Anthony, and I'm watching the Hartford Whalers, all the pros skate by, and obviously in awe as a kid at seven years old. And Gordie Howe picked up a bunch of snow on a stick and dumped it on my head. And then he skated around. He came back and winked at me and kind of ruffled my head a little bit. And I thought that was the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. It was the coolest thing. Gordie Howe, Mr. Hockey, dumped snow on my head and – not anybody else, just me. And for that for that 30 seconds, it was just me and Gordy Howe. That was it. He recognized me. He great story. He showed he showed his his ability to to reach out and and acknowledge me. And I've always been a fan of acknowledgement. Acknowledge people, say hi, say hello, let them know that you appreciate they're there. So when Gordy Howe did that to me, it gave me a story that he, for him it was nothing. He's just dumping snow. He's having fun. For him, it was nothing. For me, it was a lifelong story. And I knew that I could do that and I can create stories like that for thousands and thousands and millions of kids by just acknowledging them, show them that I appreciate them being there. I'd throw pucks up in the stands, make sure I'd, I'd reach my hand through the, the camera pole during, during commercials, grab popcorn out of, a kid's, you know, out of a kid's bag and eat it, take his hat, put it on because I wanted to give people a, a, a lifelong story, but also to say, hey, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate you being a fan because if it wasn't for the fans, we'd just be a regular beer hockey league uh, team down the way with a designated beer guy, beer buyer. So I, 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 I love, I love the story. I want to switch to your grit. Um, I saw an mm-hmm. interview with Dan Patrick. You had an interview with Dan Patrick a few years ago. It looked like you had... I don't know, probably 800 stitches in your head. You look like you were about to join the sequel of Young Frankenstein. Um, (laughs) And I'm sitting there saying to myself, man, this guy is one top SOB. Is that true? Am I reading that right? Did you have about 800 stitches in your head? 800 stitches. 800 stitches in this way. We've we've got this kid, Villar, in the Mets now. He he busted his nose the other day. He wants to get back in the lineup. Um, I love that. You know, I I love that too about him. But give us the mentality give us the sentiment of jeremy ronick uh with 800 stitches in his head doing an interview yeah. like that um and john I, pay attention because you may end up with 800 stitches in your head after this interview <laughs> so pay attention okay pay attention what he's about to say 
Um, but the ha ha why, he he me getting fired. Go ahead, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. Want to do things that other people won't do. Be different. You know, for me, I I wanted to be the guy that. If, if somebody like I'll, I'll catch a rattlesnake when it's sitting in front of me, I tried to jump on an alligator because it was there and I'll do that because my buddy wouldn't. I wanted to play with a broken jaw because I wanted to win for my city because I know that other people wouldn't do it. And I, I think you test yourself, you test your limits, you test your fortitude. And I think people understand that you're, you're, you're engaged. You're, you're hundred percent in when you do things when other people won't, whether it's through injury or through fear or through uh, it, just a, a lot of different reasons. But I wanted to be the guy that everybody said, wow, that guy's crazy. Or wow, that guy, you know, he, he gave it all. I never wanted anybody to question my effort or my craving or my desire to win. And no matter what the case may be, I, I'll always heal. I'll heal, but I wanna win. And I want I want my name to go in in history in that win column because everything else will heal. I just want people to I want people to remember me for as being a warrior. I don't want to be you know a, a guy that you know people will forget. I don't want to be forgotten. I love it, and so it's it's about creating memories. It's about it's about enforcing that culture, but it's also uh, it emanates into your team, doesn't it? I mean, I I always felt that the sure. teams that you were on. Uh, they picked up something from that grit, something from your endurance and your and your your stamina. Uh, if you were going to describe the cultures of the teams that you were a part of, uh, what did you like? What, what what were the best cultures? You don't have to name the specific teams, yeah, but like, right. what were the emblematic best cultures, and what were you trying to do to make those teams better from a cultural mm -hmm. perspective? Number number one is respect is respecting everybody. Right. You don't have to like everyone, but you have to respect everyone. And that respect goes a long way. So for in the in the culture of a of a hockey locker room, um, you have to be able to sometimes be a friend and sometimes be um, be a big brother or be a, a, a somebody that is a yeller and a screamer. You sometimes you have to drag people into fights. And you know, when you have a culture where you know that you love each other. And you're all in it for the same reasons, but sometimes we might not agree and we might not uh, get along. We might scream at each other, but at the end of the day, we all have the same goal in mind. And that culture is, it has to go one by one through each person. Because if you have a couple guys who aren't bought in, in that mentality, you're not going to win. You're never going to be successful because they're going to bring, they're the anchor that's going to bring you down. That's not going to let you to sail through. Tell us about a few memorable moments from your career. What, what stands out? Uh, a couple things. 1991, um, uh, my first All-Star game. I was 21 years old. Uh, I was playing in Chicago. The All-Star game was in Chicago. It was during the Gulf War. They almost canceled the game because of the Gulf War. But I remember Chicago Stadium, when the anthem played, it was the loudest I've ever heard a stadium in my life people yelling, people screaming during the anthem. There were flags on the on the rafters. There were signs on the rafters about how amazing our, our country was. And uh, it was a really cool way to start my first All-Star game at home in front of my own fans with our fans showing how, patri how patriotic they were. It was an amazing, and I almost won the MVP. I had a goal and two assists, almost had the MVP until Vinny Damfu scored three goals in the last two minutes and took it away from me. But we won't go down that road and then two, <laughs> and then two, you know 2002 I played in the in the Olympics and, and won a silver medal and we played t uh, Canada who was our biggest rival and through the 80s and 70s we you know American hockey was not a powerhouse but because of the 1980 Olympic team 1990s we were a powerhouse and we we got to the epic the epic platform by playing in the Olympic gold medal, playing against the team that we hated the most, respected the most, but admired the most, and that was Canada. And that was when we said, as an American, as Americans, hockey was a superpower. And I love that aspect. And scoring my 500th goal was pretty special too, even though it sucked. I, 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 lo I love it. I, it is a good corollary question. So tell us about some of these players that you hated playing against. 
Yeah. Who did you, who were some of your favorite players? So I hated playing against Mark Messier. I was af- absolutely scared to death. He was one of the most intimidating people I've ever seen on the ice. Hit him with his square jaws, that, that big, that big, that, the, the look that Mark Messier had, not only the mentality that he had, I remember lining up against Mark Messier the first time and he looked across from me and I, I always, this is, this is what I say to people. I said, he looked at me like he wanted to eat my children. And it just one of those mentalities, like, I don't care who you are. I'm going to run you over and I'm going to beat you no matter what. And I told the referee, drop the puck as fast as you can. Don't let me in this circle. And that was when I was a young kid. So I hated playing against Mark Messier, but you know, he had the toughness, the talent, the fortitude, and probably one of the best leaders in the history of the game. So I hated playing against him. Um, you know, playing against a guy like Steve Eisman, uh, who was just an amazing, uh, an amazing leader. And again, the, the talent level, uh, Mario Lemieux, who came back from cancer to lead the league in points to, you know, having a guy who's six, six, you know, play the way that Mario Lemieux played and make everybody look ridiculous. Standing still was pretty unbelievable. But these are the guys that, I mean, I played in the best, the best hockey generation of all time and people can argue it but they'll lose the argument. If you look at some of the players that played through the late eighties and and nineties and early two thousands. Well, I remember Mark Messier. I can take you back to June of 1994. I was a young salesman at Goldman Sachs clawing for tickets for game seven against Vancouver. And uh, I was there when he lifted that cup and boy, I got to tell you, that was one exhilarating experience. And since I am a New Yorker, I'll give a shout out to Joe Rosano, who's a friend of yours and mine. Yes. Uh, I can't stand Joe Rosano because he <laughs> is from Boston. Let me just explain why. Okay, You go into the uh, Logan Airport, into the security yeah. area, all you see are the Celtic banners, the Patriot banners, the Bruin banners. And I am a longtime suffering Nick, Ranger, Jet, and Met fan. Okay, not to Ooh. mention the Red Sox. Okay, so... I love Joe wow. Rosano, but I hate him as a fan. I just have to tell Joe that I know he's listening very carefully. But I did we have a great moment at the age of 30 watching Mark Messier carry that Stanley Cup around yep. Madison Square Garden's ice. Uh, how different is well. playoff hockey from the regular season? How hard is it to make the Stanley Cup finals? Uh, it's well, let me put it to you I played 20 years, Anthony, and I made it once. I made it in 1992. And I remember in 1992, um, Michelle Goulet and Steve Larmer, who uh, both, well, Michelle Goulet is a Hall of Famer. Steve Larmer should be a Hall of Famer. Looked at me and said, we got to win this one because it might be your last time here. And I laughed at him. I'm like, you kidding me? I said, I'm 22 years old. I'm going to make a bunch of these finals. Never made the finals again. It is one of the hardest, one of the most depleting, frustrating uh, journeys of any sport of any lifetime, because you got to win four out of seven games. You got to get four rounds. You're getting the absolute crap beat out of you every single night. You're playing every other night and you're playing against guys that are skating three or four times faster because it's playoffs. Now, I don't know if you know this, but playoff hockey players in the national hockey league stop getting paid on the last day of the regulation season of the regular season their paychecks stop. So the playoffs, they granted, they get bonuses, but nothing compared to the salaries that they make, but they get bonuses, but they play in playoffs to win the Stanley cup. That's how, that's how storied this, this trophy is. It's the hardest trophy to win in sports and the guys play their best hockey when they're not getting paid. And that tells you a lot about the character and desire and and what really means the most to hockey players is they want to carry that Stanley cup around. I don't know if you watched a few years back, the Washington capitals won the, the Stanley cup yeah. against Las Vegas Knights. Alex Ovechkin showed the world how to party and how to celebrate <laughs> winning a Stanley cup. There was not ne- never, I think he was drunk for three months straight <laughs> with the cup. He drank out of the cup. He celebrated like there was no other. He actually won the MVP, the con Smythe for the most talented, for the best player of the playoffs. He didn't even pick it up. He, he threw it on the bench, didn't even look at it, wanted to go back to get that Stanley Cup, and, and he celebrated it more and better than anyone else. And this is a Russian superstar. 
And that tells you how hard it is and how great it is to win the Stanley Cup. It's and amazing. I never got it's to a, do it. It's an yeah, it's story. amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. John Dorsey tries to replicate that when he gets a order for our Bitcoin fund, Jeremy. So I tell him yeah, to pull sure. out a little bit. So you, you, you pivot to life after hockey. This is really tough for athletes. Um, you know, hockey, baseball, basketball, you're at the top of your game. You're being cheered by tens of thousands of people. Uh, you're an international superstar celebrity. And now you're taking off the cleats, the spikes, the skates, and you're returning to what we would all call normal life. Discuss that transition. Uh, you've done an amazing job, frankly. So how did you do an amazing job? And what do you recommend to athletes as they make transitions like that? It, you know, it's scary too, because when you're, when you're an athlete, you know, nothing more than being an athlete. So when you come to the end at a very young age, for me, it was 39 still, that's, that's very young as, as our life goes. But what are you going to do afterwards? A lot of these kids today, they're making enough money that they could probably last the rest of their lives. But um, there's some that aren't. And, you know, to set yourself up, number one, you, I think you have to be an outgoing guy. I think you have to, you have to be educated as, as much as you possibly can. And for a lot of these kids, investing the right way, making sure they put their money to, the, to work in the proper way. There's a lot of guys that played in the 90s that I've played with that did not put their money in the right places. They they splurged it. They gambled it. They didn't. Uh, they thought they were going to be rich forever, and they didn't put the they didn't pack away their money in their socks or put it away in stocks and bonds the way they were supposed to, you know, triple A stocks, triple A bonds to make sure that they were taking care of themselves for after hockey. Um, so for me, I was a talker of all times. I. I, I love people and I love to talk and I love to be around people. So for me, television was a good uh, way to go. But, um, you know, the we miss GM you on NBC, of, JR. We miss you. Yeah, on NBC. I love you. Thanks, John. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. And, he's, he's, the, he's the Pierce Morgan of NBC Sports. OK, you know, so we got <laughs> to bring him back. So but I got one yeah. last I got one last question for you. I'm going to turn it over to the erstwhile John Dorsey to get some of these questions from our audience. Got great participation today. And for those of you that are lighting me up on my text messaging related to Joe Rosano, I take it back, Joe. I do love you. I just happen to hate Boston <laughs> sports fans, okay? I'm a New it's Yorker. Champions, Look at Jeremy. Sorry. He's got the New York Giants behind him, okay? So be nice, Joe Rosano. Be nice. Look at this. Look, I'll, I'll go up a little bit higher, too. We got big old Gretz in the Ranger jersey. There you go, baby. Oh, there you go, Rangers, yeah. Uh, well, that yeah. was a lot of there fun when he, came, when he came to New York as well, the great yeah. one. So, yeah. Um, we see lots of athletes getting involved in the crypto space. Uh, lots of members, frankly, of the hockey community. Uh, so what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Do you own any? So I've been looking at it for a long time and I actually uh, was friends with a, um, with one of the, the starters and one of the employees, I, I would say one of the engineers of Bitcoin, uh, Blythe Masters, about 10, 12 years ago, who came on board to start Bitcoin. So I've known about it since the beginning never really understood what Bitcoin was until maybe the last five or six months when it's just exploded. And I know it's a, I know it's a volatile, it's a, it's a volatile business, but I think it's Bitcoin is one of those things that you have to, if, if you don't look at it and you don't take it, take it seriously, then you're, you're not a very smart person because within the world of the digital age, where we know that there's so many things happening in, in our world through computers and, uh, obviously, through control of uh, of of currency, uh, if you don't look at an alternate um, system of currency, then you, you're a dinosaur. So for me, I was I've been looking into it. I know a lot of people who are involved in it um, now. Looking at the NFT space, I even I even read a, a, an article um, in Bloomberg a couple of weeks ago. You called you called Bitcoin the apex predator. I love that. I mean, I love that aspect that. Uh, that you, that you see a you see an entity you see an industry that's that has the ability to blow its blow off the off the charts, um, you know. And you're getting involved in it with Skybridge, Mass Mutual is getting involved in it. I mean, I see a lot of good things happening in Bitcoin. I don't own any yet, but I I, I want to learn about it a little bit more because I know a lot of my friends are, are doing very very well in it. They're spending you know spending a lot of money getting involved. So um, I'm, I'm I like it. And I, I will get involved in it and maybe you can help me learn more about it because I, I think it is the currency of the future. And, and when I, whenever I don't have the government watching over all my money and I can, I can use it through blockchain and I trust blockchain and all that stuff, I think it's a, it's a great way to do business. And 
let people let the people see what I'm doing, not the people in government see what I'm doing. I, I like that aspect about Bitcoin. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm going to turn it over to John. I appreciate your your thoughts there. I got a question. Um, I got a question for you. I got a question for you though. I, I, sure. I, I are you getting involved with the the NFT? Because a good friend of mine, Matthew Kachuk, he's getting involved with the NFT. Which is the art through through digital currency, which I think is un unbelievable. And you guys, you know, you guys have your own your own Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. done my research so i know but you guys yeah, have listen, your own I, I, bitcoin you know, I fund I, I i'm going to be brief because i don't want to, this is the jeremy ronick show i don't want to take up too much time but all, all we're saying to people is if you come into our fund we've got safety security great accounting where there's a layer of insurance from lloyds of london that protects the coins god forbid if they're stolen uh, and we're going to eventually convert the fund into a liquid etf once the federal government the mm -hmm. sec allows us to and so we think it's a low cost vehicle for people to own coins and own mm -hmm. them safely and securely. Now you could own them directly on Coinbase. I'm a big believer in Coinbase. Uh, truth be told, I own stock in Coinbase. I just think that for hodling purposes, which is the mm -hmm. misspelling of the word holding, which is a technical term that we use in Bitcoin jargon that we're gonna hold this stuff forever. Yep. Uh, the vehicle, the mousetrap that we've created, we think it's a better mousetrap. As it relates to NFTs, uh, Skybridge will have an Ethereum fund. Uh, we're launching yep. that probably July 1. Uh, that's uh, basically those those contract tokens, if you will, or the ones that fuel the NFT engine. You will likely have some of your memorabilia or some of your ideas. Some big sports celebrities have done that already uh, in the NFT space. Our friends yep. like Gary Vaynerchuk have sold. Tre uh, Trevor Lawrence Tre Trevor Lawrence is doing it. Yeah. Matthew Kachuk's doing it. Yeah, it's good stuff. Exa exactly. I should do so one. I should do one. You, 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 you Absolutely. should do one. Okay. I, and I, and I would buy one on, on the, I want the 800 stitches that were taken out of your face. All right. okay. I, All I, right. I'll buy the token for that uh, because it's just such a metaphor for great grit and great uh, courage in the face of everything. Um, but yes, we're, we're going to be involved in that. Well, I think there's a big great. future in that. I think that the world is digitizing. We yes. have to be there, Jeremy. And I often tell people, I hold up this phone, this phone is too good to be true. A lot of things happening in the crypto space are too good to be true. So investors yeah. are like, well, if it's too good to be true, let me run from the woods. You know, that was right. the case with Bernie Madoff, obviously. But look at this phone. This phone can eat up all the data in this room. Every book can be held in this phone, every picture, et cetera. Um, and the world is digitizing and the world is yep. miniaturizing. And it would make sense that money would also be improved by all of this technology around us. And we have to be a part of that future. I, I appreciate and respect people like Charlie Munger. I view him as an intellectual mentor of mine, but I feel that he is not embracing where the world is going. Uh, and it's reminiscent of what Henry Ford once said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. He built them a horseless carriage yeah. and the mm -hmm. rest is history. So I'm gonna turn it over to John though. We've got about 15 or so minutes left. Uh, John, there's probably 10 or 12 questions in yep. the queue. Uh, and, and Jeremy, it is a great honor to be with you. And you, uh, for the people listening, if we haven't offended you yet, we're going to try to do so in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> um, I recall my wife hot. A lot of people would be called <laughs> yeah, I mean, hot. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I thought that I was pretty great. I mean, I thought that was pretty brazen well, for you know, John just to be, you know, he's flirting, he's flirting with your wife over the Zoom call. It's very impressive, John. Uh, apparently, it's a fireable offense to say someone's attractive, um, but we won't get yeah, into that. Not at Sky. Well, I'm the personnel director at Skybridge, so you get a pass from me. I, I'm referring I, to I, the, I, the nonsense John, over at John, John, I, I, You know, John, people that get... are people that are zooming with us right now, they realize my level of wokeness is at an index of 0 0.1. So, go ahead, Darcy. Awesome. What were you saying, uh, Jr.? I said my, I don't think my wife's going to fire me. I think. All right, gonna... that's good. Um, we have three questions from Max. We're going to get through. We have about 10 minutes left, so I want to get through each of these questions pretty quick, JR. So the first question is, what's the most underappreciated skill, personality trait, or mindset off the ice required to be an elite NHL player night in, night out? Um, focusing, and, and, and for me, it's, um, it's using, using your brain while you're not performing, while you're not on. Um, 
I was always a good visualization guy. I use visualization all the time. So for me, if, if, if you're thinking about something, you love something, you're always thinking about how you're going to be better, putting yourself in the situations that you know you're going to be in uh, and, and asking yourself what you would do in those situations before you get to them. Visualization is an amazing tool for people to be prepared for what might come to them in the future. And you're going to make better decisions if you think about it before, because it's the things that surprise you that take you off guard that you haven't thought about before that make you make the wrong decision. So for me, it's visualization. Don't ever stop thinking about something that you love the most. Right. What's one of the best lessons that you've taken from either an elite coach that you played for or another elite veteran player that maybe uh, in the early days of your career that you played with, that you took, that carried you through your career? Uh, I was sitting in the locker room, John, one day, and um, we were getting ready to go out for a game. And uh, my teammate next to me turned to me and goes, you got me? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? I, I got you. I said, He said, you got me? And I went, uh, yeah, sure. But what, what do you mean? He goes, are you going to play your best game tonight? Like, if I make a mistake, you're going to be there. You're going to help me out. You got me because I'm going to make mistakes tonight. I'm going to have to rely on you. If I make a mistake, you're going to be there for me. And it was kind of like he was obviously testing me. It was wasn't right. anything, but but when you think about it, so whether you are at work and you're with your coworker, or you're at home with your family, or you're with your friends, um, it's not a bad idea to ask them. You got me. You got me. I like it um, because because that 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 makes you accountable, and it makes right. you accountable to, to 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 be as as good as you can be because somebody else is asking you to be. Last question from Max. One night out at a bar in Scottsdale, which former teammate do you want to go out with that night? That's a tough one. Chris Chelios, no question about it. <laughs> Chris Chelios. Guy, the guy can, drink, guy can drink more beer than anybody I've ever seen and wake up the next morning and look like he never, never touched it. So it's pretty amazing. Another legend. So uh, legend. we have a question um, – from an anonymous attendee about, did you ever grow up in the DC area at all playing for either the little caps or the Fairfax team? And did you ever want to play for the caps? I did. I grew, I lived uh, in 2000. Uh, I'm sorry, 1980 to 1983. I lived in Fairfax County, played for the Washington metros and we turned it into the junior caps, uh, I think in 1982. So um, I grew up uh, Washington, you know, Washington capitals fan went to Landover to watch games at, for the caps and yeah so i grew up in the, in the area and has bec have become um you know i would say a secondary fan of washington capitals because boston bruins were always my my favorite sorry anthony right no i uh, I'm, at, my... I'm at peace i'm getting so i'm getting lit up from joe rosano fans i'm at peace jeremy what can i tell you that if, if the rangers hey, or the Joe's mets win guy, another man. thing in my lifetime i'll be at total peace Joe, Joe's a popular man. I'm telling you, I, he's a great man. I love him. In my personal uh, bracket for this playoff season, I have my Carolina Hurricanes beating the Boston Bruins. I think going through that gauntlet of that division this year has prepared the Bruins for, for greatness. So uh, that, that's what I've got. I know you know Rod Brendamore a little bit, right? Yeah. Another uh, just gritty I guy. I do. Uh, great Rod guy. the Bod. Rod, Rod the Bod. They had to kick Rod him the out bod. of the trick. They had to kick him out of the training room because he wouldn't leave. He, he spent all of his time in there. Yeah. You just look at Brendan Moore's face and you're like, that guy is tough as nails. Uh, he just has that hockey look to him. But uh, Jerry he's literally, is he's literally he's, ch he's chiseled out of stone. 100% oh, absolutely. Chiseled out of stone. Yeah. Still, he's like more fit than anybody on the team. But uh, yep. Jerry's asking the toughest goalies to score against in your career. And he needs a good Marty, Eddie the yeah. Eagle story. Yeah, Marty Brodeur was the hardest for me. And he would just, he would, he, he would go like this. The, if the net was here, as he is standing in front of the net, he'd stand over here and he'd give me the whole side of the net and I'd shoot there and go like this and he'd laugh at me. And if right. I was standing in front of, if I was standing in front of the net, he would literally, he'd take his stick and he'd go and he'd right in where there's no padding in between my legs where there's no padding and dropped me like a stone. He <laughs> frustrated me like crazy. Um, an Eddie Belfour story that I, I mean, I have tons of them, but Dave, Eddie Belfour never wanted you to shoot above his knees in the first 10 minutes of practice. Dave Manson, who was a beast of a man, first shot, whistled a slap shot in practice right by Ed, Ed's ear. 
Next time Dave Manson came down to shoot a puck on Eddie Balfour, Eddie flew out of the net and literally clotheslined, clotheslined <laughs> Dave Manson with a, with a cross check across the face at center ice. And the whole team fought for about 10 minutes because Dave Manson. So after that day, not one person ever shot a puck over the knees on Ed Belfort in the first 10 minutes of practice because we knew we were going to get our asses kicked by him if we did. Right. Um, Ken is asking, who do you like? I, I said I like my Carolina Hurricanes. Who do you like to win the Stanley Cup this year? And how important do you think for a team like the Islanders, uh, having somebody like Barry Trotz on the bench is for a yeah. hockey team success? Well, the coach sets the, sets the tone. They, they, they put in place the system. They put in place the mentality. Uh, they make sure that the right players are teamed with the right people. And you have to have a mentality. I think Barry Trotz is, is, is perfect as a perfect coach for the New York Islanders. You see what they've done over the last couple of years, being one of the best, best defensive teams in the National Hockey League. Then you put a, then you put a guy like Lou Lemorello in the, in the press box that puts people on the ice and sets a mentality. It's, I mean, for that's that is a tough team to beat and Pittsburgh has their hands full for sure. Um, but I think Colorado, I think Colorado is going to win. I think they I think they're going to bring it all together in playoffs. I think the regular season they were going through the motions because they knew they had a team that they, that could win. And you, they're they're battling hard against Minnesota. But if they can get past Minnesota, I mean, not Minnesota, I mean, through. Uh, yeah, through Minnesota, if they can get past them. Um, Oh, no, hold on. They're playing, no, Dallas is Vegas. So they're playing, yeah, St. Louis. They can get St. past St. Louis yeah. easily. They get past St. Louis easily, um, which they seem like they are. I, I don't see them letting out. I think Colorado is too deep of a team. Uh, Dr. Peter is asking whether you wish you ever played for the Bruins. I actually had a chance to play for the Bruins in 2001. They offered me the biggest contract in the history of the Boston Bruins, and I said no because they just traded away Billy Guerin. So I said, how can you trade away Billy Guerin and want to win a Stanley Cup? And now you're trying to get me. So if they kept Billy Guerin, I would have signed in Boston in 2001, but they were going the wrong way. Right. Um, who was the smartest in terms of their hockey sense player that you ever played with? Uh, probably that I ever played with. I mean, I played with so many different, different people in my lifetime. Um, Mike Medano, I've played with him on 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 Olympic teams. Um, I've played I've played in All Star games with you know Mario Lemieux with uh, with Wayne Gretzky. I've played with the smartest guys in the world. Um, you know Michelle Goulet was probably who not many people know of is a Hall of Famer, 500 goal scorer, probably the most probably the, the most intelligent, smartest hockey mind that I played with at least. Uh, Andrew is asking his wife is we're going to ask two more questions here. His wife is from Montreal. Is it true that because women from Quebec are tougher than the men, that's why fighting is still a big part of hockey. <laughs> that's fantastic. I'm, I'm not going to argue with her because she'll probably find me and beat the crap out of me. So no, I, I yeah, I, I love Canadians. I love, I love, I love uh, the, the Quebec aspect too. Cause I love the French Canadians. I'm, I think their love for hockey up there and their knowledge of hockey and their passion for it. I've always had a soft spot for my, for a lot of the hockey fans up there in Toronto and up in Quebec and Montreal, all over the place. All right. Last question. Um, are you going to come back to us on TNT or on ESPN? What's next for Jr.? I don't know. It's up to them. It's up to them. I mean, I would love to come back on television because one of the greatest things that I've ever done has been able to sit on a set and, and, and join people in their living room and help them understand hockey, talk about hockey, teach them about hockey and give them real true analysis, not this mumbo jumbo cliched, you know, you know, crap that, uh, that we see a lot where you can pretty much, it's a, a blanket statement you can say about every game without even watching it. I want to tell people what I'm seeing. I want to tell people what, what, you know, what went wrong, what was good, what players were bad, what players were great, why the referees stunk, why the referees were great. I don't, I think fans deserve to have true analysis and fair analysis and honest analysis. And hopefully I can join, you know, maybe TNT or ESPN at some point and be able to join people in their homes and, and, and enjoy hockey when the hockey actually isn't being played. All right. Well, it's a pleasure for us to be able to have you, uh, you know, we wish you were on TV, but it's a pleasure for us to be able to do this with you as the Stanley Cup playoffs uh, ramp up, but we'll do it again. 
out of time for today. But Anthony, you have a final word well, listen, for Jr. No, before we let him go. We'll we'll see you at the Salt Conference. Um, and can't wish wait. You, wish you uh, great success in everything you're doing. Something tells me you will be back on the air, uh, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, your personality is certainly missed, Jeremy, and so thank wish you. you nothing but great success. And I know. Now that the pandemic is hopefully uh, coming to an end, we're going to get a chance to see each other personally. Sounds good. Look forward to it. Look forward to doing an NFT with NFT with you too. Let's get <laughs> on. It. Let's get I, on. I, I love that. I love, love, love that idea. We'll get yeah, Matthew Kachuk awesome. to uh, to teach us. So. Done. You guys Take are care. great. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for joining. Everybody appreciate it.